Chapter 6 Mildred's brother had told her just what she would have to do before she could pack up and head for the desert. He instructed her on how to go about selling the house so she could make some money. At least a few thousand dollars. Her eyes lit up at the mere thought of having that much money in her possession. She had no idea how much she'd paid in interest in principal. Had never kept track. But since more white folks had started moving into the neighborhood, the house must have appreciated. The boundaries had started changing so that now the portion of 25th Street where she lived was considered Midtown instead of South Park. It occurred to Mildred that this would be the first time she could make money off of white people. The agent didn't quite see it that way. First, the house would have to be appraised. Then he would have to find a suitable buyer. Said he didn't want just anybody moving into this house, especially since Mildred had kept it up so nicely. And there was no telling how long it might take to actually sell the house and consummate all the paperwork, which meant she didn't know how soon she would have a check in her hand. So when Faye Love told her that there was an opening at Lapper Lake's nursing home, and since she was the supervisor and could hire anybody she wanted to on the spot, Mildred took the job. Two months later, Mildred was so sick of smelling old people she didn't know what to do. Her patience had gotten clogged up like hair in the drain. Curly May had told her she should get herself a prescription for nerve pills, and Mildred did. Thought they just might be the plunger. They seemed to do the trick. Pushed about 50 pounds away from her skull, put each little worry into his very own compartment, and gave her the keys to unlock each one when she felt up to it. At first, she didn't take more than she was supposed to most of the time, not as many doses per day as she'd been prescribed. But after a few days of taking them that way, she got so dizzy she slept for almost 13 hours. Mildred didn't like sleeping that long. She liked knowing what her kids were doing and where they were at all times. When she came home from work, she would pop one and sip on a beer, like she was doing now, standing in the middle of the sun porch in her white uniform which had a stain on it from where old Mrs. Henry had thrown up on her. She sipped the foam from the top of the glass and sat down in the recliner. The kids were watching Wagon Train. I got something to tell y'all and I want each and every one of you to keep your mouths closed and listen to every word I have to say, whether you like it or not. You understand? Her children turned around to face her. Now y'all know that we've been through a few cold and hungry days, but ain't none of you starved or froze to death, have you? Well, Sometimes you have to do things in this world that you don't want to do in order to make things right when they're wrong, easier when they're hard. You know what I mean? They nodded their heads up and down, although they had no idea of what she was talking about. They figured if they stayed with her, they would catch on. Ain't y'all tired of this old dull manga town? Mildred didn't give them a chance to answer. Wouldn't y'all like to make some new friends and go to a nicer, prettier school? The main reason I'm asking, telling, you this is because your Uncle Leon, the one out there in Arizona in Phoenix, wants us to move out there with him and his kids. He said they got good jobs out there for colored people, even women, and cheaper, bigger, finer houses. And guess what? It don't even snow out there. And they ain't got those aggravating ass mosquitoes. Y'all can learn to swim and play outside all year round without no coats and boots or gloves. Don't that sound nice? She glared at them. But Mama, Frida said, I just tried out for cheerleading this year, the junior varsity team, and it might be my only chance. I'd be the first colored to ever make it. What would we do with Prince? Money whined. He don't like hot weather. And what about my bike? How am I get it all the way to Arizona? Where is Arizona anyway? And what about Chunky and Boo Boo and Big Man and Little Man? Ain't gonna have no friends in Arizona. What I tell you about saying ain't boy? You'd think they didn't teach you how to speak English in school. Bootsy, Angel, and Doll went along with their older sister and brother. Yeah, we don't want to move to no Arizona. People die in deserts. How long does it take to get there? Probably weeks, Angel said. The other two huddled near her. What's wrong with this house? Asked Frida, crossing her arms and making a huffing sound. We like this house. We don't want to go nowhere and I only got four more years till I graduate. Mildred had figured as much, but it didn't matter because her mind was made up. She clenched her fist and started gritting her teeth. This always scared the kids and made them see things her way. Look, I know what y'all likes to do, too. 
Frida. Girl, you can cheerlead in Arizona. Don't you think they play basketball and football no place else besides Point Haven? They got better high schools than that little rinky-dink one on 24th Street. And money, you can always make new friends, boy. So stop acting like a sissy. And them little hoodlums you hang around with ain't worth a pot to piss in no way. Meet some civilized kids in Arizona. And Prince ain't never told you he didn't like hot weather, did he? Dogs go where their owners go. Look at it this way. Most of the colored people in this town ain't never been no farther than Detroit. And it'll give your cousins and friends a good reason to go somewhere new for a change. They can come visit in the summer. Look, I'm trying to think this thing out. And I think it's going to be the best damn move I've made in 13 years. And regardless of who don't like it, I'm the mama and daddy in this house and we going. As soon as I get myself situated. Two weeks later, Frida made the cheerleading squad at Chapella Junior High School and Money ran away from home. Mildred had just come in from work. Where's Money? She asked, kicking off her white hospital shoes in the middle of the dining room floor. He ain't, I mean, he hasn't come home from school yet, Bootsy said. None of the other kids seemed to know where he was either. And since Money didn't participate in any after-school activities, Mildred knew something was wrong. The kids were supposed to come straight home from school and had to do their chores and homework before they were allowed back outside. She said she'd wait a half hour, and as soon as he walked through the door, she was going to snatch a knot in his behind. Mildred was having a nicotine fit. She didn't want to send one of the girls to the store since it was getting dark, but she sent Frida anyway. Get me two packs of Tarantins, would you? Ask Joe if I can have them till I get my check day after tomorrow. If he says yes, then give me three packs. What Mildred didn't know was that the reason her cigarettes had been disappearing so fast was because Frida had been smoking them at home and with her girlfriends after school when she went over to their house to watch Dark Shadows. Frida came back with the three packs about ten minutes later. Mildred told her not to take off her coat. She made the other girls put theirs on. Go find that boy. Look everywhere. Check the Patterson's and the Howells, but don't come back in his house without him. They were gone almost an hour, and when they returned, they were all out of breath. They told Mildred they couldn't find him, and no one had seen him. That's impossible. Y'all can't tell me that in the town this damn small ain't nobody seen a little nappy-headed colored boy. Mildred called over to Curly Mays, who sent her boys to look for him. They went straight to the White Rose gas station, which had a pond behind it, where they always caught pollywogs in the spring to scare girls. Money was up to his knees in the icy water when they spotted him. He was so cold, his brown face was red and snot was running down his nose. Maybe he had thought of drowning himself, they thought, but the water was too cold and too shallow, and besides, he looked more scared than anything. Your mama is looking for you, boy. You gonna get it when you get home. Come on out of there, one of the boys said. I ain't going no fucking where. I ain't moving to no damn Arizona. I hate Arizona, and I hate my mama even more. I'm gonna drown myself if it kills me. But the boys just laughed and counted to three and ran into the pond and dragged him out. Then they tied a rope around his waist like a horse in a rodeo so he couldn't run. As they walked home, all money could think of was the beating he was going to get. But Mildred didn't beat him. When she saw him standing there wet and freezing, his teeth chattering, and his eyes dilated as if he were in shock, she was too afraid he had caught pneumonia to even think of hitting him. She didn't even scold him or raise her voice one octave, nor did she hug him, though she wanted to. Get out of those wet clothes, boy, she said. And Frida, make your brother some hot Nestle's quick. Wouldn't you like some hot cocoa, boy? Mildred couldn't stop looking into his cat eyes. Then it suddenly occurred to her that he might see in her own eyes her grief and confusion and just how responsible she felt. So she averted her glance. She didn't want money to know that she was feeling like a collapsing bridge. Mildred also knew that if she hugged him, she would be hugging a young crook and maybe never let the boy go. She watched him gulp down his hot chocolate and sensed he was all right. Then she took another nerve pill and lay down. That night, huddling on their bunk beds, which they were outgrowing, Mildred's children held a conference over popcorn and Kool-Aid. They decided they would simply boycott the whole idea of moving, just refuse to go. She'd have to go by herself. After all, she couldn't make them go. Shit, we ain't the one with the divorce problem or the money problem, Frida said. 
and we ain't trying to get away from nothing or nobody, are we? Money asked. All of them shook their heads no. The next decision to make was where everybody would live. This took some serious thinking. It soon became clear that Bootsy should stay with their Aunt Georgia since her daughter Jeannie was her age. Frida wanted to stay with the Wiggins family because they were clean, like her mama was, and always kept food in the refrigerator, a big consideration for her. And besides, she had a crush on Eric. Angel and Dahl would have to stay together and could go with Ruthie Bates because her granddaughter, Cookie, left her dolls and toys in the spare bedroom until she came to visit in the summer from Chicago. Money would stay right next door with Curly May. That way, he said, he could keep an eye out on Frida's whipping willow trees. Make sure nobody else sat under them. Millie, you sure this is what you want to do, baby? Her daddy asked. Buster was standing at the Wrangler washer, pushing clothes through the rollers. His big stomach was hanging over his pants, and his suspenders were making them hike up so his ankles showed off his white socks. His skin looked red, and he was going bald. Miss Aquila was sitting in the front room watching The Price is Right. She was dipping a piece of cornbread into a bowl of sweet milk. Her silver hair was parted down the middle into two thick braids. Buster, she called. You almost finished in there. You know them beans need to be snapped if you want to eat them tonight. Mildred rolled her eyes in Miss Aquila's direction. She still couldn't stand the woman. She was too bossy and Mildred's daddy was too gullible. He did anything she told him to. I'm almost finished, Sugar Plum, he said. To tell you the truth, Daddy, Mildred said, I don't know. It sounds like it might be better for the kids. Who knows? I might be able to find a decent man out there. Leon say they all in the service. They supposed to have some good jobs on the base. Anything got to be better than this. Buster sighed. You know your daddy would miss you and the kids. Don't too many of y'all come by and visit like you used to. You about the only one. Everybody else are always too busy. Hell, with your asthma the way it is, you might want to consider coming out there too. They say it's dry heat, which is why a lot of people move out there so they can breathe. Ain't nobody moving way out there, Miss Aquila yelled from the other room. Wasn't nobody talking to you, Aquila, Mildred said. Buster shook his head back and forth as if pleading with Mildred to not say anything that would upset Miss Aquila or get her started on one of her tangents. Mildred waved her hand at him as if to say, forget her, I'm talking to you. I still got a few more years at the foundry before I can retire. The house is paid for, and by the grace of God, I'm still sitting here. Mildred just shook her head, hugged her daddy, grunted a goodbye to Miss Aquila, and stuck her hand through the hole in the screen door to open it, since the handle was only on the outside. When the agent told Mildred he had found a buyer, he also told her it would be at least another month before the closing. Mildred immediately made it known to her neighbors and friends that they could walk through her house and take their pick of the junk she was going to leave behind, as long as she wasn't cooking or cleaning. For weeks afterward, she made the kids take trips to the grocery store to get empty toilet paper and laundry detergent boxes so they could pack. I'm putting all this shit in storage until we can afford to leave. It's going to take a lot more money than I'm going to get from this house for us to move. Plus, I got to give your daddy some of it. We're going to stay with Lula and Ike for a month or two until I get some of these bills paid off and get enough money to haul all this mess out of there. Maybe buy another car, then we leave it. When the kids heard this, there was a lot of heavy moaning. Lula Wilson was Mildred's baby sister and had six dumbbells for kids. They lived in a big old raggedy house on the other side of 24th Street where the city had already torn down at least 10 homes to make room for the industrial park. Lula had a simple husband whom everybody called Simple Ike. Though he wasn't so simple, he couldn't take care of his family. He also worked at the foundry, snapping steel parts together for diesel truck engines. Lula was even simpler than Ike was, which is why they got along so well. Everything was funny to them, and they were always grinning. The kids, too. The entire family was a bunch of slobs, though. When the kids saw that Mildred wasn't kidding, they circled around her. Mama, they got roaches, said Frida. And Junior caught two mice last week in the bathtub and three upstairs in Linda and Cindy's room, said Bootsy. 
They ain't even got no dryer and they nasty. Where we gonna sleep on the floor? Money asked. Nasty ain't the word for it, added Frida. Mama, you never even let them spend the night over here without leaving their bags outside to air out. And now you want us to go over there and live? She crossed her arms and started crying. Everybody started crying. Mama, can we stay somewhere else? What about Grandma Honey or Granddaddy Buster? Asked Boosie, who was getting so that she had to put her two cents in whenever she could. They nasty too, interjected Frida. I don't like Grandma Aquila, Angel said. She's too mean. And all she do is spit snuff. If y'all open those little ignorant mouths and say another word about the subject, I'm going to get your daddy's leather belt and beat your asses till they turn purple. Lula is the only one who got enough room and enough heat. And she's my sister and it's free and it ain't like it's going to be forever. And since it's so damn nasty over there, maybe y'all will get a chance to help keep it a little cleaner. Do something for somebody else for once in your lives. Now leave me alone, please. I got a lot on my mind. Frida, give me one of my nerve pills and a beer, would you? For the next two months, they endured life with the Wilsons, and it was more like living in the Detroit Zoo. There were 11 kids running wild between two floors, all under the age of 15. And before they had been there a week, Mildred found out that her children knew what they were talking about. Lula was past simple. She was closer to stupid and beyond filthy. And no matter how much Mildred's kids did around there to clean up and pick up, Lula's will come right behind them and tear up, mess up, or junk up what they'd just done. Then Mildred found out that she wasn't getting as much money as she thought from the house. She needed at least a few thousand dollars in order to move herself and the kids, the furniture, buy a decent car, and then find a place to live. She didn't have any intention of staying more than a few weeks with Leon. Shit. She still had to give Crook his part of the money. For three whole days, she calculated and recalculated her figures, which only made her head hurt. Maybe the time ain't right, she thought. If it don't fit, don't force it. And she changed her mind about moving to Arizona just like that. The kids couldn't have been happier. Mama, we don't have to stay here, do we? Asked Boosie. No, nah, not much longer. I'm thinking. Just give me a minute to figure this shit out. Mildred wanted her house back, but the agent had already consummated the deal and sold it to a big black woman named Carabelle, who dressed like a man, kept her hair in three skinny braids, and ran a brothel full of tired whores. Mildred approached her and the dry cleaners about buying the house back, but Carabelle, who smoked the pipe, simply blew smoke in her face. No deal. Carabelle had plans for that house. Mildred knew how to fight fire with flames and figured if she told the agent what Carabelle's line of business was, the note would be reconsidered. But he just told her that what that woman did for a living was her business, so long as she paid the bill. Now where are we going, Mama? Frida asked. Give me a minute. Just give me a hot minute, Mildred said. She patted her feet as she let her mind wander up and down the streets of South Park. Then she made a loud snap with her fingers and walked to the telephone. Baby Franks, an old friend of hers and Crook's a World War II veteran, who was fond of loose women, owned a house on 32nd Street, right at the railroad crossing. Mildred knew it was vacant because she always passed it on her way to see her daddy. It was a big old house sitting in the middle of two acres of land, with the rolling front yard so long and so wide, most of the other inhabitants had used a riding lawnmower to cut the grass. There were pear trees, apple trees, a plum tree, and blackberry bushes in the woods that stood at the edge of the backyard. The rooms were huge, and everything else about it was quite decent. There was even a real fireplace in the living room. So what if there were only two bedrooms? Money would just have to sleep on the sun porch.